Track Five, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley, of BigBible.org. Track Five, The First Epoch, Thirteen. The exposed situation of the churchyard had obliged me to be cautious in choosing the position that I was to occupy. The main entrance to the church was on the side next to the burial ground, and the door was screened by a porch walled in on either side. After some little hesitation, caused by natural reluctance to conceal myself, indispensable as that concealment was to the object in view, I had resolved on entering the porch. A loophole window was pierced in each of its side walls. Through one of these windows I could see Mrs. Fairley's grave. The other looked towards the stone quarry in which the sexton's cottage was built. Before me, fronting the porch entrance, was a patch of bare burial ground, a line of low stone wall, and a strip of lonely brown hill, with the sunset clouds sailing heavily over it before a strong steady wind. No living creature was visible or audible. No bird flew by me, no dog barked from the sexton's cottage. The pauses in the dull beating of the surf were filled up by the dreary rustling of the dwarf trees near the grave, and the cold, faint bubble of the brook over its stony bed. A dreary scene, and a dreary hour. My spirits sank fast as I counted out the minutes of the evening in my hiding-place under the church porch. It was not twilight yet. The light of the setting sun still lingered in the heavens a little more than the first half-hour of my solitary watch had elapsed when I heard footsteps and a voice. The footsteps were approaching from the other side of the church, and the voice was a woman's. "'Don't you fret, my dear, about the letter,' said the voice. "'I gave it to the lad quite safe, and the lad took it from me without a word. He went his way, and I went mine, and not a living soul followed me afterwards, that I'll warrant.' These words strung up my attention to a pitch of expectation that was almost painful. There was a pause of silence, but the footsteps still advanced. In a moment two persons, both women, passed within my range of view from the porch window. They were walking straight towards the grave, and therefore they had their backs turned towards me. One of the women was dressed in a bonnet and shawl. The other wore a long travelling cloak of a dark blue colour, with the hood drawn over her head. A few inches of her gown were visible below the cloak. My heart beat fast as I noticed the colour. It was white. After advancing about half-way between the church and the grave, they stopped, and the woman in the cloak turned her head towards her companion. But her side face, which her bonnet might now have allowed me to see, was hidden by the heavy projecting edge of the hood. "'Mind you keep that comfortable warm cloak on,' said the same voice I had heard already the voice of the woman in the shawl. Mrs. Tardis right about your looking too particular. Yesterday all in white. I'll walk about a little while while you're here. Churchyard's not being at all in my way. Whatever they may be in yours. Finish what you want to do before I come back, and let us be sure and get home again before night. With these words she turned about, and retracing her steps advanced with her face towards me. It was the face of an elderly woman, brown, rugged, and healthy, with nothing dishonest or suspicious in the look of it. Close to the church she stopped to pull her shawl closer round her. Queer, she said to herself, always queer, with her whims and her ways, ever since I can remember her. Harmless, though, as harmless poor soul as a little child. She sighed, looked about the burial ground nervously, shook her head, as if the dreary prospect by no means pleased her, and disappeared round the corner of the church. I doubted for a moment whether I ought to follow and speak to her or not. My intense anxiety to find myself face to face with her companion helped me to decide in the negative. I could ensure seeing the woman in the shawl by waiting near the churchyard till she came back, although it seemed more than doubtful whether she would give me the information of which I was in search. The person who delivered the letter was of little consequence. The person who had written it 
was the one centre of interest and the one source of information, and that person, I now felt convinced, was before me in the churchyard. While these ideas were passing through my mind, I saw the woman in the cloak approach close to the grave, and stand looking at it for a little while. Then she glanced all around her, and taking a white linen cloth or handkerchief from under her cloak, turned aside towards the brook. The little stream ran into the churchyard under a tiny archway in the bottom of the wall, and ran out again, after a winding course of a few dozen yards, under a similar opening. She dipped the cloth in the water and returned to the grave. I saw her kiss the white cross, then kneel down before the inscription, and apply her wet cloth to the cleansing of it. After consideration how I could show myself with the least possible chance of frightening her, I resolved to cross the wall before me, to skirt around outside, and to enter the churchyard again by the stile near the grave, in order that she might see me as I approached. She was so absorbed over her employment that she did not hear me coming until I had stepped over the stile. Then she looked up, started to her feet with a faint cry, and stood facing me in speechless, motionless terror. "'Don't be frightened,' I said. "'Surely you remember me?' I stopped while I spoke, then advanced a few steps gently, then stopped again, and so approached by little and little, until I was close to her. If there had been any doubt still left in my mind, it must have been now set at rest. There, speaking affrightedly for itself, there was the same face confronting me over Mrs. Fairley's grave, which had first looked into mine on the high road at night. "'You remember me?' I said. "'We met very late, and I helped you to find the way to London. Surely you've not forgotten that?' Her features relaxed, and she drew a heavy breath of relief. I saw the new life of recognition stirring slowly under the death-like stillness which fear had set on her face. "'Don't attempt to speak to me just yet,' I went on. "'Take time to recover yourself. Take time to feel quite certain that I am a friend.' "'You are very kind to me,' she murmured. "'As kind now as you were then.' She stopped, and I kept silence on my side. I was not granting time for composure to her only. I was gaining time also for myself. Under the one wild evening light, that woman and I were met together again. A grave between us, the dead about us, the lonesome hills closing us around on every side. The time, the place, the circumstance under which we now stood face to face in the evening stillness of that dreary valley, the lifelong interests which might hang suspended on the next chance words that passed between us, the sense that, for aught I knew to the contrary, the whole future of Laura Fairley's life might be determined for good or for evil, by my winning or losing the confidence of the forlorn creature who stood trembling by her mother's grave, all threatened to shake the steadiness and self-control on which every inch of the progress I might yet make now depended. I tried hard, as I felt this, to possess myself of all my resources. I did my utmost to turn the few moments for reflection to the best account. "'Are you calmer now?' I said, as soon as I thought it time to speak again. "'Can you talk to me without feeling frightened, and without forgetting that I'm a friend?' "'How did you come here?' she asked, without noticing what I had just said to her. "'Don't you remember my telling you, when we last met, that I was going to Cumberland? I've been in Cumberland ever since. I've been staying all the time at Limeridge House.' "'At Limeridge House?' Her pale face brightened as she repeated the words, her wandering eyes fixed on me with sudden interest. "'Ah! How happy you must have been!' she said, looking at me eagerly, without a shadow of its former distrust left in her expression. I took advantage of her newly aroused confidence in me to observe her face, with an attention and a curiosity which I had hitherto restrained myself from showing for caution's sake. I looked at her, with my mind full of that other lovely face, which had so ominously recalled her to my memory on the terrace by moonlight. I had seen Anne Catherick's likeness in Miss Fairley. Now I saw Miss Fairley's likeness in Anne Catherick, saw it all the more clearly because the points of dissimilarity between the two 
were presented to me as well as the points of resemblance. In the general outline of the countenance and general proportion of the features, in the colour of the hair, and in the little nervous uncertainty about the lips, in the height and size of the figure and the carriage of the head and body, the likeness appeared even more startling than I had ever felt it to be yet. But there the resemblance ended, and the dissimilarity in details began. The delicate beauty of Miss Fairley's complexion, the transparent clearness of her eyes, the smooth purity of her skin, the tender bloom of colour on her lips, were all missing from the worn, weary face that was now turned towards mine. Although I hated myself for even thinking such a thing, still, while I looked at the woman before me, the idea would force itself into my mind that one sad change in the future was all that was wanting to make the likeness complete which I now saw to be so imperfect in detail. If ever sorrow and suffering set their profaning marks on the youth and beauty of Miss Fairley's face, then and then only, Anne Catherick and she would be the twin sisters of chance resemblance, the living reflections of one another. I shuddered at the thought. There was something horrible in the blind, unreasoning distrust of the future which the mere passage of it through my mind seemed to imply. It was a welcome interruption to be roused by feeling Anne Catherick's hand laid on my shoulder. The touch was as stealthy and as sudden as that other touch which had petrified me from head to foot on the night when we first met. "'You are looking at me, but you are thinking of something,' she said, with her strange breathless rapidity of utterance. "'What is it?' "'Nothing extraordinary,' I answered. "'I was only wondering how you came here.' "'I came with a friend who is very good to me. "'I've only been here two days.' "'And you found your way to this place yesterday. "'How do you know that?' "'I only guessed it.' "'She turned from me, and knelt before the inscription once more. "'Where should I go if not here?' she said. "'The friend who is better than a mother to me "'is the only friend I have to visit in Limeridge.' Oh, it makes my heart ache to see a stain on her tomb. It ought to be kept as white as snow, for her sake. I was tempted to begin cleaning it yesterday, but I can't help coming back to go on with it to-day. Is there anything wrong in that? I hope not. Surely nothing can be wrong that I do for Mrs. Fairley's sake. The old grateful sense of her benefactress's kindness was evidently the ruling idea still in the poor creature's mind, the narrow mind which had, but too plainly, opened to no other lasting impression since that first impression of her younger and happier days. I saw that my chance of winning her confidence lay in encouraging her to proceed with the artless employment which she had come to the burial-ground to pursue. She resumed it once, on my telling her that she might do so. Touching the hard marble as tenderly as if it had been a sentient thing, and whispering the words of the inscription to herself over and over again, as if the lost days of her girlhood had returned, and she was patiently learning her lessons once more at Mrs. Fairley's knees. "'Should you wonder very much,' I said, preparing the way as cautiously as I could for the questions that were to come, "'if I owned that it is a satisfaction to me, as well as a surprise, to see you here? I felt very uneasy about you after you left me in the cab.' She looked up quickly and suspiciously. Uneasy, she repeated. Why? A strange thing happened after we parted that night. Two men overtook me in a chaise. They did not see where I was standing, but they stopped near me, and spoke to a policeman on the other side of the way. She instantly suspended her employment. The hand holding the damp cloth with which she had been cleaning the inscription dropped to her side. The other hand grasped the marble cross at the head of the grave. Her face turned towards me slowly with the blank look of terror set rigidly on it once more. I went on at all hazards. It was too late now to draw back. The two men spoke to the policeman, I said, and asked him if he had seen you. He had not seen you, and then one of the men spoke again, and said you had escaped from his asylum. She sprang to her feet, as if my last words had set the pursuers on her track. "'Stop, and hear the end,' I cried. "'Stop, and you shall know how I befriended you.' A word from me would have told the men which way you had gone, and I never spoke that word. I helped you escape. I made it safe and certain. Think, 
Try to think. Try to understand what I tell you. My manner seemed to influence her more than my words. She made an effort to grasp the new idea. Her hands shifted the damp cloth hesitatingly from one to the other, exactly as they had shifted the little travelling bag on the night when I first saw her. Slowly, the purpose of my words seemed to force its way through the confusion and agitation of her mind. Slowly, her features relaxed, and her eyes looked at me with their expression gaining in curiosity, what it was fast losing in fear. "'You don't think I ought to be in the asylum, do you?' she said. "'Certainly not. I'm glad you escaped from it. I'm glad I helped you.' "'Yes, yes, you did help me indeed. You helped me at the hard part,' she went on a little vacantly. "'It was easy to escape, or I should not have got away. They never suspected me as they suspected the others. I was so quiet and so obedient, and so easily frightened.' The finding London was the hard part, and there you helped me. Did I thank you at the time? I thank you now very kindly. Was the asylum far away from where you met me? Come, show that you believe me to be your friend, and tell me where it was. She mentioned the place, a private asylum, as its situation informed me, a private asylum not very far from the spot where I had seen her. and then with evident suspicion of the use to which I might put her answer, anxiously repeated her former inquiry. "'You don't think I ought to be taken back to you?' "'Once again, I'm glad you escaped. I'm glad you prospered well after you left me,' I answered. "'You said you had a friend in London to go to. Did you find the friend?' "'Yes. It was very late. But there was a girl up at needlework in the house, and she helped me to rouse Mrs. Clements. Mrs. Clements is my friend, a good, kind woman, but not like Mrs. Fairley. Ah, nobody is like Mrs. Fairley. Is Mrs. Clements an old friend of yours? Have you known her a long time? Yes, she was a neighbour of ours once at home in Hampshire, and liked me and took care of me when I was a little girl, years ago. She went away from us and wrote down in my prayer book for me where she was going to live in London, and said, if you're ever in trouble, Anne, come to me. I have no husband alive to say me nay, and no children to look after. I will take care of you. Kind words, were they not? I suppose I remember them, because they were kind. It's little enough I, I remember besides. Little enough. Little enough. Had you no mother or father to take care of you? Father, I never saw him. I never heard mother speak of him. Father, our ah, dear, he is dead, I suppose. And your mother? Uh, I don't get on well with her. We are a trouble and a fear to each other. A trouble and a fear to each other? At those words the suspicion crossed my mind, for the first time, that her mother might be the person who had placed her under restraint. Don't ask me about my mother, she went on. I'd rather talk of Mrs. Clements. Mrs. Clements is like you. She doesn't think that I ought to be back in the asylum and she is as glad as you are that I escaped from it. She cried over my misfortune, and said it must be kept secret from everybody. Her misfortune. In what sense was she using that word? In a sense which might explain her motive in writing the anonymous letter? In a sense which might show it to be the too common and too customary motive that has led many a woman to interpose anonymous hindrances to the marriage of the man who has ruined her? I resolved to attempt the clearing up of this doubt before more words passed between us on either side. What misfortune? I asked. The misfortune of my being shut up, she answered, with every appearance of feeling surprised at my question. What other misfortune could there be? I determined to persist as delicately and forbearingly as possible. It was of very great importance to me that I should be absolutely sure of every step in the investigation, which I now gained in advance. There is another misfortune, I said, to which a woman may be liable, and by which she may suffer lifelong sorrow and shame. What is it? she asked eagerly. The misfortune of believing too innocently in her own virtue, and in the faith and honour of the man she loves, I answered. She looked up at me with the artless bewilderment of a child not the slightest confusion or change of colour, not the faintest trace of any secret consciousness of shame struggling to the surface 
appeared in her face, that face which betrayed every other emotion with such transparent clearness. No words that ever were spoken could have assured me, as her look and manner now assured me, that the motive which I had assigned for her writing the letter and sending it to Miss Fairley was plainly and distinctly the wrong one. That doubt, at any rate, was now set at rest, but the very removal of it opened a new prospect of uncertainty. The letter, as I knew from positive testimony, pointed to Sir Percival Glyde, though it did not name him. She must have had some strong motive, originating in some deep sense of injury, for secretly denouncing him to Miss Fairley in such terms as she had employed, and that motive was unquestionably not to be traced to the loss of her innocence and her character. Whatever wrong he might have inflicted on her, it was not of that nature. Of what nature could it be? "'I don't understand you,' she said, after evidently trying hard and trying in vain to discover the meaning of the words I had last said to her. "'Never mind,' I answered. "'Let's go on with what we were talking about. Tell me how long you stayed with Mrs. Clements in London, and how you came here.' "'How long?' she repeated. I, "'I stayed with Mrs. Clements till we both came to this place two days ago.' "'You're living in the village, then?' I said. "'It is strange that I should not have heard of you, though you've only been here two days.' Uh, "'No, no, no, not in the village. Three miles away at a farm. Do you know the farm? They call it Todd's Corner.' I remembered the place perfectly. We'd often pass by it on our drives was one of the oldest farms in the neighbourhood, situated in a solitary, sheltered spot, inland at the junction of two hills. "'They are relations of Mrs. Clements at Todd's Corner,' she went on, "'and they often asked her to go and see them. She said she would go and take me with her, for the quiet and the fresh air. It was very kind, was it not? I should have gone anywhere to be quiet and safe and out of the way. But when I heard that Todd's Corner was near Limeridge, oh, I was so happy! I would have walked all the way barefoot to get there, and see the schools and the village and Limeridge House again. They are very good people at Todd's Corner. I hope I shall stay there a long time. There is only one thing I don't like about them, and I don't like about Mrs. Clements. What is it? They will tease me about dressing all in white. They say it looks so particular. How do they know? Mrs. Fairley knew best. Mrs. Fairley would never have made me wear this ugly blue cloak. Ah! she was fond of white in her lifetime, and here is white stone about her grave, and I am making it whiter for her sake. She often wore white herself, and she always dressed her little daughter in white. Is Miss Fairley well and happy? Does she wear white now, as she used when she was a girl?" Her voice sank when she put the questions about Miss Fairley, and she turned her head further and further away from me. I thought they detected, in the alteration of her manner, an uneasy consciousness of the risk she had run in sending the anonymous letter, and I instantly determined so to frame my answer as to surprise her into owning it. "'Miss Fairley was not very well or very happy this morning,' I said. She murmured a few words, but they were spoken so confusedly and in such a low tone that I could not even guess what they meant. "'Did you ask me why Miss Fairley was neither well nor happy this morning?' I continued. "'No,' she said quickly and eagerly. "'Oh, no, I never asked that.' "'I will tell you without your asking,' I went on. "'Miss Fairley has received your letter.' She had been down on her knees for some little time past, carefully removing the last weather-stains left about the inscription while we were speaking together. The first sentence of the words I had just addressed to her made her pause in her occupation and turn slowly without rising from her knees so as to face me. The second sentence literally petrified her. The cloth she had been holding dropped from her hands, her lips fell apart, all the little colour that there was naturally in her face left it in an instant. "'How do you know?' she said faintly. "'Who showed it to you?' The blood rushed back into her face, rushed overwhelmingly, as the sense rushed upon her mind that her own words had betrayed her. She struck her hands together in despair. "'I, I never wrote it. She gasped affrightedly. "'I know nothing about it!' "'Yes,' I said. "'You wrote it, and you know about it. It was wrong to send such a letter. It was wrong to frighten Miss Fairley. If you had anything to say, that it was right and necessary for her to hear, 
you should have gone yourself to Limeridge House. You should have spoken to the young lady with your own lips. She crouched down over the flat stone of the grave, till her face was hidden on it, and made no reply. "'Miss Fairley will be as good and kind to you as her mother was, if you meant well,' I went on. "'Miss Fairley will keep your secret, and not let you come to any harm. "'Will you see her to-morrow at the farm? "'Will you meet her in the garden at Limeridge House?' "'Oh, if I could die, and be hidden, and at rest with you!' Her lips murmured the words close to the gravestone, murmured them in tones of passionate endearment to the dead remains beneath. "'You know I love your child for your sake. Oh, Mrs. Fairley, Mrs. Fairley, tell me how to save her. Be my darling and my mother once more, and tell me what to do for the best.' I heard her lips kissing the stone. I saw her hands beating on it passionately. The sound and sight deeply affected me. I stooped down and took the poor, helpless hands tenderly in mine, and tried to soothe her. It was useless. She snatched her hands from me, never moved her face from the stone. Seeing the urgent necessity of quieting her at any hazard and by any means, I appealed to the only anxiety that she appeared to feel, in connection with me and with my opinion of her, the anxiety to convince me of her fitness to be mistress of her own actions. Come, come. I said quietly. Try to compose yourself, or you'll make me alter my opinion of you. Don't let me think that the person who put you in the asylum might have had some excuse. The next words died away on my lips. The instant I risked that chance reference to the person who had put her in the asylum, she sprang up on her knees. A most extraordinary and startling change passed over her. Her face, at all ordinary times, so touching to look at in its nervous sensitiveness, weakness, and uncertainty became suddenly darkened by an expression of maniacally intense hatred and fear, which communicated a wild, unnatural force to every feature. Her eyes dilated in the dim evening light, like the eyes of a wild animal. She caught up the cloth that had fallen at her side, as if it had been a living creature that she could kill, and crushed it in both her hands with such convulsive strength that the few drops of moisture left in it trickled down on the stone beneath her. "'Talk of something else,' she said, whispering through her teeth. "'I shall lose myself if you talk like that.' The very vestige of the gentler thoughts which had filled her mind hardly a minute since seemed to be swept from it now. It was evident that the impression left by Mrs. Fairley's kindness was not, as I had supposed, the only strong impression on her memory. With the grateful remembrance of her schooldays at Limeridge, there existed the vindictive remembrance of the wrong inflicted on her by her confinement in the asylum. Who had done that wrong? Could it really be her mother? It was hard to give up, pursuing the inquiry to that final point, but I forced myself to abandon all idea of continuing it. Seeing her as I saw her now, it would have been cruel to think of anything but the necessity and the humanity of restoring her composure. I'll talk of nothing to distress you. I said soothingly. "'You want something?' she answered sharply and suspiciously. "'Don't look at me like that. Speak to me. Tell me what you want. I only want you to quiet yourself, when you're calmer, to think over what I've said.' "'Said?' She paused, twisted the cloth in her hands, backwards and forwards, and whispered to herself, "'What is it he said?' She turned again towards me, and shook her head impatiently. "'Why don't you help me?' she asked with angry suddenness. "'Yes, yes,' I said, "'I will help you. You will soon remember. I ask you to see Miss Fairley to-morrow, and to tell her the truth about the letter. Ah, Miss Fairley, Fairley, Fairley!' The mere utterance of the loved familiar name seemed to quiet her. Her face softened and grew like itself again. "'You need have no fear of Miss Fairley,' I continued, "'and no fear of getting into trouble through the letter. She knows so much about it already that you will have no difficulty in telling her all. There can be little necessity for concealment, where there is hardly anything left to conceal. You mention no names in the letter, but Miss Fairley knows that the person you write of is Sir Percival Glyde. The instant I pronounced that name, she started to her feet, 
and a scream burst from her that rang through the churchyard and made my heart leap in me with the terror of it the dark deformity of the expression which had just left her face lowered on it once more with doubled and trebled intensity the shriek of the name the reiterated look of hatred and fear that instantly followed told all not even a last doubt now remained her mother was guiltless of imprisoning her in the asylum a man had shut her up and that man was sir percival glyde the scream had reached other ears than mine on one side i heard the door of the sexton's cottage open on the other i heard the voice of her companion the woman in the shawl the woman whom she had spoken of as mrs clements i'm coming i'm coming cried the voice from behind the clump of dwarf trees in a moment more mrs clements hurried into view who are you she cried facing me resolutely as she set her foot on the stile how dare you frighten a poor helpless woman like that she was at anne catherick's side and had put one arm round her before i could answer what is it my dear she said what has he done to you nothing the poor creature answered nothing i'm only frightened mrs clements turned on me with fearless indignation for which i respected her i should be heartily ashamed of myself if i deserved that angry look i said but i do not deserve it i have unfortunately startled her without intending it this is not the first time she has seen me ask her yourself and she will tell you that i am incapable of willingly harming her or any woman i spoke distinctly so that anne catherick might hear and understand me and i saw that the words and their meaning had reached her yes yes she said he was good to me once he helped me she whispered the rest into her friend's ear strange indeed said mrs clements with a look of perplexity makes all the difference though i'm sorry i spoke so rough to you sir but you must own that appearances look suspicious to a stranger it's more my fault than yours for humouring her whims and letting her be alone in such a place as this come my dear come home now i thought the good woman looked a little uneasy at the prospect of the walk back and i offered to go with them until they were both within sight of home mrs clements thanked me civilly and declined she said that they were sure to meet some of the farm labourers as soon as they got to the moor try to forgive me i said when anne catherick took her friend's arm to go away innocent as i had been of any intention to terrify and agitate her my heart smote me as i looked at the poor pale frightened face i will try she answered but you know too much i'm afraid you'll always frighten me now mrs clements glanced at me and then shook her head pityingly good night sir she said you couldn't help it i know but i wish it was me you had frightened not her they moved a few steps i thought they'd left me but anne suddenly stopped and separated herself from her friend wait a little she said i must say good-bye she returned to the grave, rested both hands tenderly on the marble cross, and kissed it. "'I'm better now,' she sighed, looking up at me quietly. "'I forgive you.' She joined her companion again, and they left the burial ground. I saw them stop near the church and speak to the sexton's wife, who had come from the cottage, and had waited, watching us from a distance. Then they went on again, up the path that led to the moor. I looked after Anne Catherick as she disappeared till all trace of her had faded in the twilight i looked as anxiously and as sorrowfully as if that was the last i was to see in this weary world of the woman in white end of track five